Good afternoon. We would like to start today's webinar off by sharing IARS's updated mission and vision statements. The IARS supports anesthesia research and education with the overarching goal to improve patient care. This is our mission and vision. IARS supports these vital programs fulfilling our mission. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hemmerling to introduce today's speakers. Hello and welcome to this webinar. I'm Thomas Hemmerling, one of the executive editors uh, of Anesthesia and Analgesia and the section editor for technology, computing and simulation. The webinar complements the themed February issue of Anesthesia and Analgesia entitled Anesthesia 2050, an issue in which international experts explain to us how they envision anesthesia and critical care medicine in 2050. The section editor of technology, a position jointly staffed by the Society of Technology and Anesthesia and Anesthesia and Analgesia, has the pleasure to come up with a special theme every couple of years. In 2022, I approached then editor-in-chief uh, Jean-Francois Pitet, professor in Baltimore and an international expert in critical care medicine, and proposed the theme Anesthesia 2050. He was, as usual, both supportive and enthusiastic. Right away, we both knew that we could not cover all aspects of this theme, with themed issues usually selecting between eight and 10 papers. I apologize for all the topics we could not include here. I chose the topics which I felt were interesting for the general readers of our journal. I specifically asked the authors to present the past development, the present state of clinical art, and then focus on their outlook for 2050 for each topic. I deliberately asked them to think outside the box. I'm very happy that Anesthesia and Analgesia accepted my wish that each article should be introduced with either a visual abstract or an infographics. Nathan Naveen and his team did a great job. The themed issue is accompanied by two podcasts, which are already listed on the website, featuring two articles out of 11. This webinar will cover three more articles. I have to thank the new editor-in-chief, J.D. Pandit, for his support, his nice editorial for the issue, as well as his accomplished editing, making many articles better. I would also like to thank ANA editing and managing team, especially Daniel Mount, without whose help all this would not have been possible. We have three pre-recorded presentations, starting with Francesca Rubolato, who is the McGill's Chair of Critical Care Medicine, and a consultant at Imperial College in London on UK and her international co-authors who will present the article entitled Mechanical Ventilation, Past, Present and Future. Pascal Laferriere Langlois is an assistant professor in anesthesia at the University of Montreal. He will present the article Depth of Anesthesia and Nociception Monitoring, Current State and Vision for 2050. And I myself will present the article Robotic Anesthesia 2050, which was co-written with Sean Jeffries. Following the pre-recorded presentations, all presenters will be available for a Q&A session. Thank you all for tuning in. My name is Francesca Rubulotta. I will present a narrative review about the past, the present, and the future of mechanical ventilation. This narrative review is published in Anesthesia and Analgesia and is part of a large, very interesting collection. The narrative review has examined mechanical ventilation over time and it has included author for all over the world. In the past, ventilation was provided manually, intermittently, and it was primarily used for resuscitation or as a last resort for patients with severe respiratory and cardiovascular failure. The earliest mechanical ventilation machines for prolonged ventilatory support were large. They required a significant amount of skills and expertise to operate. These early devices had limited capabilities, limited battery, and safety features were poor. 
the physiology of mechanical ventilation was modified when mechanical ventilators moved from negative to positive pressure. Sadly, monitoring systems were not developed and available at that time. It was very difficult to predict and to prevent harm for patients and those that could be ventilated were only healthy adults or elderly children. Technology and devices designed to use you through tracheostomy were introduced only later on into the um, intensive care unit. In the present, positive pressure ventilators are more sophisticated and those are widely used for extensive period of time. Modern ventilators use mostly positive pressure ventilation, but the monitoring is finally available. Those machines are more portable and their processors are much easier to operate. They can be programmed and they can provide different level of support based on the needs. They can allow a more synchronized ventilation, which is comfortable for patients. And monitoring systems are more sophisticated and often integrated in those machines. The physiology is better understood. Therefore, patients that can be ventilated are elderly and more frail. Mechanical ventilators can be operated by experts, but even less skilled people can initiate in a situation of emergency or in protected environment uh, the support for uh, sick patients. One of the most significant advancements in mechanical ventilation has been the introduction of productive lung ventilation to the point that nowadays we can even provide diaphragm protective ventilatory support including non-invasive ventilation using the same machine. Healthcare professionals are familiar with the use of mechanical ventilators in many countries and several countries are even respiratory therapists that are skilled and available experts that can work in a team to provide the best care and guarantee the best outcome for patients. Analgo sedation and the use of drugs is changed and those have been fundamental for increased comfort and provide the opportunity to synchronize those machines better with uh, patients in the intensive care unit, both adults and children. What's about the future? Well, looking to the future, mechanical ventilation is likely to continue to evolve and to improve alongside with monitoring technique and drugs, sedatives, analgesic drugs. There is an increasing precision in the monitoring global patient ventilator interaction to work a structure and analyze the pattern of synchrony or dyssynchrony among those two elements. One area of development is the use of artificial intelligence, and in particular is uh, the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning to provide a more adapted ventilation to any individual patient. With As the understanding of the physiological process of breathing evolved, interest in the development of negative pressure ventilators grew. Initial experiments were conducted on animals, but gradually these large machines were designed for resuscitation of adults. John Dalziel designed and built the first so-called tank ventilator in 1838. This machine, considered of an airtight box in which the patient would sit, was efficient and the design was made sitting up because this position was described comfortable by the sickest. No detailed explanation of causes leading to the increased work of breathing was published, but clinical evaluation of patients suggested that the sitting position was best for ventilators purposes, for ventilatory purposes. The airtight box worked manually simply by decreasing the pressure within the box around the chest, inhalation, and the release of the plunger conversely produced exhalation. Nurses were trained 
for monitor consciousness, there was nothing else to be seen in those patients completely inside the machine. And those nurses were fundamental part of this process. We will argue those were the first respiratory therapists. In 1976, Alfred Wallace built the first functionally mechanically powered negative pressure ventilator. This was called iron lung. A metal rod was placed on the patient's chest, and this could measure the changes in the size. This was the first surrogate of the tidal volume. In 1904, Ferdinand Sovebrach created the first negative pressure operating chamber, a large area where even the surgeon could enter in the machine. That was called the respiratory room. In 1908, Peter Lord created a multi-person negative pressure chamber, and this is uh, in the Boston Children's Hospital. One of the most problematic things at that time were complications. Patients could not be monitored, and things like the tongue shock caused sudden cardiac arrest, and physicians couldn't understand the rationale behind those uh, physiological events. Thankfully, this problem has been overcome in recent time. In 1917, Boyle's original anesthesia machine was built, and finally, at the beginning of the center, tracheostomy were placed, and during the polio pandemic, epidemic, Ibsen started what contemporary is known as critical care. Hello everyone, I'm uh, Sabri Susi, I'm an anesthesiologist and uh, intensivist uh, in the academic group uh, of Toronto Western Hospital uh, in Canada and I'm uh, delighted uh, to present in this webinar on our um, review paper published recently uh, in anesthesia and uh, analgesia. So in this figure, we highlight the uh, different uh, or distinct current physiological concepts of uh, protective mechanical uh, ventilation, uh, especially on the lung, uh, with low tidal volume, low driving pressure, and uh, low petrol pressure as well, in association with the use of sedation to limit excessive respiratory drive. Um, protective ventilation also involves uh, to be protective regarding the right ventricle, uh, mainly with the use of PEEP to recruit without uh, over distension of the lungs, so that we don't have this impact on the right ventricle uh, uh, function. And here the use of echocardiography is key to detect uh, or to diagnose the RV dysfunction, uh, including acute corcuminality. Diaphragm protective mechanical ventilation should be uh, installed uh, as, uh, as soon or started as soon as, as possible uh, with the avoidance of excessive inspiratory efforts and poor uh, patient uh, ventilator uh, uh, interactions such as uh, asynchronous. And last but not least, a protective oxygen therapy to limit uh, oxidative stress uh, associated with inflammation uh, is also uh, important. Uh, to uh, to our patients, especially when targeting an SpO2 around 92%. So in this uh, second figure uh, published in our paper, we highlight the challenges of a positive uh, pressure mechanical ventilation and its impact on the cardiovascular system, especially the right ventricle again, uh, regarding the venous return and the increase of the afterload of the RV and how it can impact a stroke volume and uh, cardiac output uh, in uh, uh, LDS patients, for example. We also highlighted the uh, different uh, treatment options, especially those reported in the uh, updated European Society of Intensive Care Medicine guidelines published last year. In this uh, uh, third figure, uh, we suggest uh, physio a physiology-based approach 
for an intraoperative length protective uh, ventilation based on low tidal volume on the monitoring of uh, the driving pressure. So if the driving pressure is higher than 15 centimeter of water, for example, we should look at different potential causes, for example, the modification of the position, uh, uh, the circuit disconnection, and an intervention should be started as soon as possible within uh, chronological order, uh, ventilator-driven um, alveoli uh, uh, recruitment maneuvers with, for example, a CPAP of 30 centimeter of water during uh, 30 seconds. Then set the lowest PEEP associated with the lowest driving pressure or if you want uh, the, the highest uh, respiratory system uh, compliance with a constant uh, tidal volume. And um, last and not least, decrease uh, the tidal volume to five to six ml uh, per kilo. Thank you for attention. And now I let uh, the future for our colleagues uh, from Spain, Barcelona. Hello. Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Blanc. And in this article, we try to um, report um, what will be the future of mechanical ventilation. I mean, based on, on that slide, we are describing some features that now are not present in the, in the ventilators. I mean, summarizing, this is in a slide when we show some chaotic behavior of a patient under the ventilator. You can see flow and you can see airway pressure. When there is some chaos, there is some entropy indicators that it tells us that this patient is at risk of a very poor patient ventilator interaction or at risk of an unplanned extubation. In this example, in this example, what we try to say is that the future of mechanical ventilation will deal with I mean, the analysis exactly of um, features that are present in the waveforms that actually uh, the human eye cannot, cannot see, like profound, I mean, or continuous or in clusters, um, asynchronous or poor patient ventilator interaction. In the future, this will be analyzed and put to the electronic medical record because together with other parameters of the patient to construct a more precise diagnosis. Additionally, these should be some alerts in order to provide recommendations on, on what to do. Still, I mean, I believe that we are far from some intelligent software that can, in that case, touch or set up the ventilator, excluding therapists or physicians. To me, the profound knowledge of physiology is absolutely necessary even for this future mechanical ventilator or to understand these, I mean, advanced indicators of profound asynchronous or poor patient ventilator interaction. So in any case, if this future is passionate and, um, and let's see that the combination of human physiology knowledge and artificial intelligence, I'm sure will provide an excellent, an excellent future for patient uh, receiving mechanical ventilation. Thank you very much. Hello. The potential to ventilate more than one patient with a single ventilator, a so-called split ventilator setup, has been proposed during COVID. This recalls the respiratory room presented in 1908 by Peter Lord and the multi-person negative pressure chamber, which was created in 1950 by James Wilson and installed at the Children's Hospital in Boston. The idea of a centralized machine seems in contrast with the concept that the future most likely will focus on automation based on artificial intelligence. A benchmark testing model was proven possible during COVID, not ideal. The split ventilator, as well as the multi-person chamber, were used in the context of an emergency epidemic or pandemic polyepidemic and COVID pandemic. In general, personalized mechanical ventilation is a better approach or a more likely approach as be proven as an advocate of uh, individualized care and is suitable in the operating room as well as the critical environment. The past 
the present, the future of mechanical ventilation are a summary of the story of medicine and it's a fascinating journey that I've enjoyed and I hope you enjoyed too. Hi everyone, it's a true pleasure to be here and to present on this uh, recently published paper that uh, my group and I um, published in uh, Anesthesia and Algesia. Also, thank you very much uh, for inviting us to present uh, this paper, thanks to Dr. Himmerling who hosted this edition. So this presentation will uh, discuss uh, the depth of anesthesia and nociception non monitoring. We'll explore what is the current state of this kind of monitoring and what could happen in the near future. So uh, here are my uh, disclosures. There's also a very nice infographic which has been made uh, in the link with this paper. And of course, throughout the presentation, we'll take each of these sections. So first DOA monitoring, then nociception, and afterward uh, will be more innovative. We'll explore uh, the kind of scenarios that we describe in this uh, paper. Before jumping in onto the uh, actual monitors, let's take a uh, short look at what is the use, the current use that is based, uh, being made of this kind of uh, monitors. So this was a survey that was conducted uh, on uh, 564 um, responders, mostly Europeans, and basically they were asked the questions, how often do you use hypnotic monitoring, so depth of anesthesia monitoring, and anti nociception monitoring? And we see that while hypnotic monitoring was uh, considered used on most occasions by at least 70% of the responders, anti nociception monitoring was used uh, much more rarely. Interestingly, 58% of the responders reported the lack of knowledge regarding the published algorithms on how to optimally uh, manage death of anesthesia and anti nociception. Also very interestingly, the responders uh, identify hypnotic monitoring as a good tool to prevent a lot of cognitive postulative disorder. So whether it is delirium uh, or uh, POCD, postulative cognitive disorder. And, uh, it was also considered to reduce awareness while anti nociception monitoring was uh, considered to reduce myocardial infarction. When we're looking at new monitors or innovative uh, monitors, basically there are three questions that we should ask ourselves before starting to use it. We should first ask ourselves, do we want to monitor what this monitor is doing? So basically for depth of anesthesia, is it even relevant to monitor depth of anesthesia? Are we able to monitor it and then are there any clinical benefits of doing it? And of course, the paper will go in much more depth over uh, all of these questions. This presentation is only a teaser because it's only 15 minutes. So when we're talking about depth of anesthesia, well, of course, if we have an excessive depth of anesthesia, there are consequences. And if we have insufficient depth of anesthesia, there uh, will be a decreased pa patient satisfaction too. So on one side, if we go uh, too deep, we will have, of course, uh, excess uh, cardio depression, vasodilation, uh, tr being transposed into hypertension and all the uh, following comorbidities. There will be a potential positive cognitive disorder that is a literature that is uh, being developed. So all that to say that it is clearer that if we give too much anesthetic drugs, we can have some um, worse incomes. On the other hand, of course, if we do not give enough medication and reach um, sufficient depth of anesthesia, well, the patient may have what is connected awareness, also called dysanesthesia, in which the, the patient is able to create some memories. And of course, this can evolve through uh, psychological disorders uh, afterwards, such as post-traumatic stress disorder. Of course, during the surgery, also, the patient can exhibit an excessive sympathetic activity with tachycardia, hypertension, ventral myocardial infarct. So in both cases, there is a delayed post-op recovery and a decreased postural satisfaction by the client. So overall, yes, there is a fine line that we must navigate when we're talking about the anesthesia, so it is relevant to monitor. However, the next question is, are we able to monitor it? And this is a true challenge when we're talking about depth 
of Anastasia because we quickly enter into a circular dilemma. We have to define what is consciousness. What exactly do we want to monitor and do we want to prevent when using this monitor? And unfortunately, there's no standard to define what is uh, consciousness. Of course, we used a lot the concept of awareness, connected awareness, to define is a uh, depth of anesthesia monitoring working. However, as soon as we use a definition, well, of course, the monitor, the sensitivity and the specificity of the monitor will be linked to this definition. So this is a challenge when we're talking about depth of anesthesia. Also, there is a clear difference between the concept of consciousness and responsiveness. So a patient that is responsive does not necessarily build memories and vice versa. And also another challenge in this field is the fact that accidental awareness. So what is the true outcome that at first we wanted to avoid when using DOA monitoring is underreported when we're only uh, uh, using self analysis self-reporting by the patient and the difference is pretty dramatic ranging from one over nineteen thousand to as low as one over 600 when you were using the uh, bryce interview nonetheless we know that there are a lot of uh, monitors for doa during anesthesia and they are um, they are relevant to use they are able to extract electrical activity most of the time of the of the brain through electroencephalography and most of them will do a processing of this signal to recreate a more digestible um, variant or a most uh, digestible index for the end user. So among these uh, these um, commercially available technologies, we have the BIS index, the Narcotrend, the patient state index. We also have the entropy monitors, which works a little bit uh, distinctly, and the, the NeuroSense, which was also uh, more recently developed, most in the context of uh, close-up systems, which are uh, more and more developed recently. Of course, in the paper, we go in much more depth over all of these uh, technologies and ex explain their, um, their functionalities. And other, um, other technologies which exist is the middle late latency evoked auditory potential. So in opposition with uh, the other one who basically really record the electrical activity, in this one there will be a ticking sound that is uh, made uh, periodically to the patient. And we will monitor the, the evoked potential in after uh, 10 in the timing between 10 milliseconds and 100 milliseconds after the ticking and we know that as the depth of anesthesia deepens this latency will increase and the amplitude of the response will uh, be reduced so this is another strategy that's being used and finally not specifically because there is a technology that's uh, related to it but the forearm technique of uh, making sure that the patient is not paralyzed and being able to uh, respond by hand squeezing, for example, is another of these uh, monitor which exist. Now, we know that it's relevant to monitor DOA. There are some tools out there. We can question their, um, we can question how um, good they are at specifically identified DOA. But when we are using them, are there some clinical benefits and that the literature is pretty clear on it. We know that it reduces the dose of anesthetic medication that is required. We know that by reducing this medication also improve the hemodynamic status of the patient. Um, we know that it leads to a faster emergence when the, the anesthesia is stopped and also a reduced PACU stay. And again, we go in more details in the paper. When we're talking about the reduction of postoperative cognitive disorder and benefit of awareness, well, there is still a question mark. The literature is conflicting on these questions. Reduction of POCD is a very, it's a flourishing subject in, um, in the literature. Um, we uh, are exploring if, for example, birth suppression, avoiding birth suppression can reduce the incidence of postoperative uh, delirium or cognitive, longer term cognitive disorder. And when we're talking about awareness, well, um, the, the papers have demonstrated that using, when comparing the use of DOA monitors with the expired um, percentage of volatile anesthetic, there is no true benefit. But when we're doing specifically propofol anesthesia, well, there could be a reduction in the awareness. So yes, there are clinical benefits. There are still a lot of things that we can improve regarding DOA monitors. For example, um, the proprietary algorithms which are um, um, inside these uh, monitors 
were built on some specific uh, population and it's unclear how they can be exported to all the other populations uh, globally. We know that the profile of comorbidity of the patient on which the algorithms were built changed through time. So there is more psychoactive medication being used and to antidepressant, the, the population is aging. So we have to make sure that the, the, the processing that we're doing, for example, the electroencephalography is linked to these changes. And finally, one of the other things that we could improve on these uh, DOA monitors is the fact that they are well established when using GABAergic uh, medications such as propofol, but when we're using other medications such as ketamine, we know that the spectrum, the density spectral um, is uh, completely distinct and it is less captured by the current monitors. So, of course, the paper goes in more depth in uh, everything that is DOA, but for the sake of this presentation, we'll jump right away on nociception monitors. And we'll go over the same three questions. So first, do we want to monitor nociception? Well, again, there are some clear um, uh, side effects of giving too much opiates and uh, medication, postulative nausea. Uh, there's a big notion of induced opiate uh, hyperalgesia. On the other hand, if we don't give enough analgesia, well, of course, there's a more active sympathetic system with all the following uh, problems. So similarly to DOA, we know that uh, using anti uh giving too much medication or too less uh, medication of opioids lead with uh, to delayed possible recovery and reduce patient satisfaction. And while we're, we know that we're very good at measuring muscle relaxation, and we've seen that hypnosis, we're pretty good at measuring uh, DOA, analgesia, there's still a um, question of what is the optimal tool to do it. And it's a long-standing question. There was a systematic review published in 2013 demonstrated that there was already a few uh, devices out there to monitor it. Basically, these monitors use the uh, pain um, pathways to establish what should be monitored. So when there is a stimuli, well, of course, it will reach eventually the uh, central nervous system. And most of the monitors will be using the limbic system to measure the activity of the sympathetic nervous system to, um, to then corroborate under general anesthesia what is the pain or the nociception um, felt by the patient. There are numerous tools out there which are most um, most of all uh, exploring the this equilibrium between sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, activity. So there is, for example, the the pupillometry analyzing the um, how the variations of the pupil size will um, evolve throughout the surgery. A lot of monitors are exploring uh, cardiac rhythms, uh, respiratory, respiratory rates. There is skin conductance, of course, which is being used because it's linked to the autonomous nervous system. And there's the null index and nociception level index, which will integrate um, multiple parameters, including the heart rhythm, including the skin conductance. And a lot of publication has been made recently on um, this um, these tools. What we know is that it does reduce the pain uh, for the patient when he reaches the PACU. So there is a lower mean pain score when the patient is in the PACU. We also know that in the PACU, having used intraoperative um, nociception monitoring will uh, improve the, the, um, the administration of opioids, meaning that for the same pain level, there will be less administration of opioids because it will have been uh, better tailored to the patient's need. There was a, a first um, systematic review and meta-analysis published in 2020, at what point there wasn't so many published papers on antinociception monitoring intraoperatively, and only an opiate sparing effect had been fined for the SPI at that moment. However, in 2023, this was uh, reproduced, and at that moment, on top of reducing the pain in the PACU, there was a clear reduction in the intraoperative administration of um, narcotics. So now this being said, of course, the goal of the paper was also to explore what could be coming in the future. And this is probably the most uh, exciting section, uh, well, at least for me to write it uh, in, the, in the paper. We explored what could happen in the next decade. So we were talking about the challenges uh, with DOA monitoring. And for example, we know that in the next decade, we'll see an increased personalization of the monitoring of the patient. 
we'll see an integration of multiple monitors inside um, inside a single uh, wearable in which we'll be able to extract more and more data from the patient. And of course, this will follow the transition that we see with uh, general anesthesia being less and less used and sedation being more used as we get better with regional anesthesia technique. In the paper, we also explore three very transformative scenarios in which, um, for example, we explore how a groundbreaking analgesic drug could completely change the landscape of anesthesia by 2050. The second transformative scenario explored is how physically manipulating the brain activity with these implants, for example, and with the mapping of the connectome, um, how these tools will be used to shut the, the brain off instead of using chemical uh, anesthesia, we could use some physical anesthesia. And the last transformative scenario that's being explored is how we could eventually bring the patient's mind into uh, different um, alternate realities through hypnosis. We know that augmented reality, virtual reality is being already explored and um, used to reduce the patient's need in sedation. Well, there is a scenario in which eventually we could bring the patient's mind completely elsewhere while we are manipulating the body. So, of course, we uh, invite you to read the, the, the paper to see how we explore these scenarios. So, thank you very much. Thank you for the, the group for this invitation. And it's a pleasure to hear from you if you have questions. Hello and welcome to this webinar. I am Thomas Hemmerle, and I will present an article written by Sean Jeffries and myself entitled Robotic Anesthesia, Vision 2050. I am a professor of anesthesiology at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. I am a shareholder of a company called Divoco AI. My presentation does not include discussion of off-label or investigational use in some images, have been created using AI. We view anesthesiologists as pilots of the human biosphere, administering drugs that act very quickly. Anesthesiologists can be viewed as interacting with three different biospheres, consciousness, pain, and muscle function, albeit with imperfectly predictable interactions. Physiological and pharmacological knowledge combined with experience are the basis of what anesthesiologists can deliver in state-of-the-art care. In addition, there are physical interventions from anatomically guided insertion of peripheral venous cannulas or epidural catheters to ultrasound-guided insertion of central venous catheters and insertion of an endotracheal tube aided by a sophisticated video language. Robotic anesthesia, but what actually is a robot? Carol Chapek probably first used the word robot in his play Universal Rossum's Robots in 1920. The word derives from the Czech word robota for forced labor. The robots were abused as slaves until they started a revolution and destroyed mankind. There are obviously several more modern definitions of what a robot is, but for this presentation, we will use the definition I found in Britannica, where a robot is any automatically operated machine that replaces human effort, though it may not resemble human beings in appearance or perform functions in a human-like manner. By extension, robotics is the engineering discipline dealing with the design, construction, and operation of robots. In anesthesiology, we distinguished originally two forms of robots, pharmacological robots, which help us with the drug administration, and mechanical robots, which help us with performing tasks. Most recently, a third form of robot or bot has been added based on artificial intelligence, chatbots, artificial intelligent bots or other forms of automated speaking writing devices which can help us in the communication between physicians or with machines or patients i personally consider 
target controlled infusion as an early form of an anesthesia robot. Target controlled infusion, which is available worldwide except the United States, can help to reduce the anesthesiologist's workload. In brief, the system delivers a drug by infusion to a specific target concentration, either in the plasma or in a specified modeled tissue compartment of the body. Instead of programming a certain infusion rate, the anesthesiologist chooses a certain target concentration. Pharmacokinetic models in the TCI system are used to then calculate the infusion rate based on the chosen target concentration and a variety of patient parameters, such as age, weight, sex. A computer microprocessor calculates the infusion rate and other complex parameters, for example, the wake-up time at any given time. One of the main advantages of target-controlled infusion in comparison to standard total intravenous anesthesia using standard infusion pumps is the automated reduction of propofol infusion over time, thus taking into account the known drug accumulation of propofol over time. From target-controlled infusion, it seems a natural development to have closed-loop systems in place. A typical closed-loop system consists, consists of an output, an effect on the patient, in the form of monitor. The input is the variable that is controlled. In general, a drug infusion rate. Actuators, in most cases infusion pumps, manipulate the input and the control center uses feedback from a variety of sensors. A certain target is set by the user and the system aims to establish or maintain the measured variable as close as possible to the target value and this over any given time. Alexander Joston was uh, friendly enough to send me a photo of his research setup where he and his colleagues broadened the concept to a combination of several closed loop systems tested in the research environment. A dual controller for remifentanil and propofol based on bispectral index monitoring. A closed loop application of ventilation using the commercially available SUS ventilator, which allows the adaptation of respiratory frequency and tidal volume to maintain a predefined expiratory carbon dioxide between 20, 32 and 30 milli, 38 millimeters. And a closed loop fluid management system. One of the few commercially available systems for anesthesia, and in this case for sedation, was the Sedasis system developed by Johnson & Johnson. It was an automated sedation system for use in the endoscopic suite. The dosing loop was closed using an auditory or vibration command module that asked the patient to squeeze a handheld switch attached to their hand. There were several problems in the overall very appealing and absolutely necessary device. One limitation, for example, was that the Sedasi system was only able to decrease the propofol dose and not to increase it automatically. Any increase needed to be factored by the physician. And it took considerable time to achieve a certain degree of sedation, quite problematic with the fast pace of a busy endoscopic suite. Now, what about the latest addition to robotic systems, large language model, generative pre-training transformer models are artificial intelligent created language models. And there are presently several of these bots available. They can be used for an ever increasing number of tasks, like us using it to create a poster for our laboratory. Like, immediate information of practically any topic, like communication and many other tasks. And as with any robot, the language model could ease the practitioner's workload, in this case, even cognitive processing. But what about robotic, mechanical robotic devices? Robots for surgery, such as the da Vinci robot, are now well established. The precision of the robotic arms cannot be achieved by humans alone, although ultimately the surgeon moves the robotic arm. The 
Vinci robot removes tremor, allows finer cutting margins, and even allows remote surgery. In this picture, I have presented our own anesthesia robot called Kepler, used many years ago for ultrasound guided nerve blocks and intubation. It consists of obviously a computer center, a joystick, a carbon fiber, robotic programmable arm, and a new universal attachment clip, an example for a possible anesthetic robot for the future. And mechanical robots are already in use in many hospitals over the world. Korea is probably at the forefront of this development. They have been introduced to address nurse and other workforce shortages, performing routine, mainly low-level tasks, but even interacting with patients. Kirini, the robot for kids, entertaining children. Robots carrying luggage around from one floor to the next, medications or blood products. But let's really look into the future. I believe we will no longer communicate with our machines in writing or pushing buttons or screens, but using verbal command only. Indeed, command may not be accurate as we will in fact exchange opinions, ask for advice, listen to suggestions, especially as specific decision options will be offered. One could imagine a central command robot covering the whole hospital and spanning the entire patient pathway. Communication with the main robot will be a confirmation of previous anesthesia plans suggested by the robot and confirmed by the human. Now, how will it look like a patient undergoing surgery and a robot doing anesthesia in the future? Lines will already be installed in the line robot room. Once the patient then arrives in the anesthesia room, there will be one main anesthesia robot incorporating all necessary tools for induction, maintenance, and emergence of anesthesia, from ventilation through ultrasound uh, guided intubation and pain blocks. Monitoring will all be wireless. The anesthesia robot will start and induce and maintain anesthesia and prompt the anesthesiologist about all necessary actions. The robot will ventilate the lungs and advise the anesthesiologist about the next step. And in parallel, robotic surgery will take place. The surgical robot will automatically communicate with the anesthesia robot, especially important towards the end of surgery to achieve timely extubation and recovery. And then the transport robots move the patient to the recovery room where a team of recovery robots will take over. And as in everyday life, robots will slowly take over our work. And the question will then be, what will be left for us to do? I am absolutely convinced that robots and artificial intelligence will change our specialty in a way the internet changed our daily life. Thank you. Gracie, are we uh, back light? Yes, you are. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. It sounded as if we had finished on a rather depressing note. Didn't realize that my last two slides were that depressing, actually. <laughs> I sort of changed them. Um, I have uh, I have two questions for each, uh, uh, Dr. Obolata and uh, Dr. Laferia um, Langlois. Uh, probably going to start with, uh, with uh, the uh, question about the future of ventilation. Uh, now, as far as I know, I don't think there are any um, it, there's any artificial intelligence in in the modern ventilators. Uh, I obviously mentioned the Zeus ventilator here uh, in the closed loop um, area, but it's not really artificial intelligence as such. Um, I wonder your opinion about a um, is there any artificial intelligence currently available for modern ventilators, and b how would that actually look like? I mean, how would you apply artificial intelligence, which, as we all know, is not just Jet GPT, but other forms of intelligence? How would you actually see that in the future being integrated in, in uh, the ventilators? 
Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a very interesting question. And I think your last two slides gave a lot of insight of it will look like in the operating room. From a critical care uh, perspective, I cannot imagine having a, a artificial intelligence algorithm built only inside the ventilators, but the way the literature is looking at uh, uh, is presenting the integration of artificial intelligence and machine learning in critical care is uh, integrating data from the EMRs, the electronic medical records, and from the monitoring system, and then bringing up uh, early detection of diseases and uh, uh, advice for clinicians how to act and what to do, like, you know, more information and advice in predicting the trajectory of patients uh, inside the intensive care unit. Just to give you a quick example, between 2019 and 2022, 14 different uh, algorithms have been presented in the way that machine can predict developing uh, RDS in patients that are worsening and get admitted to the intensive care unit. So I think what machine learning and artificial intelligence can do is highlight the sickest of the sick in the unit and inform a clinician on what's best action to do and how to integrate ventilation within the trajectory of the patient. We don't have any of these things ready to go, but we got some trial and we got some ideas into the lab that I believe, like you said, in the next 10 years will be at the bedside. I don't know whether it is answering your question. Oh, makes I think, sense. I think it does. Uh, there, there is a there is a follow up um, when we're talking about obviously intelligent. I do remember when the pandemic started and we were short of ventilators that somebody came up with this idea of um, uh, linking two uh, or using you know uh, one ventilator for two patients, and I felt it was absolutely atrocious uh, in, in those years, like you know going back to the war zone. But um, it seems that I obviously read it in the article and, uh, and I listened to your 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 slides on it. Um, how would that uh, presently, would you sort of like consider in, a, in an extreme situation, ventilating one or two patients uh, with the same ventilator, first of all? So how would that practically look like? That might be interesting for our clinically orientated readers. And then the second question obviously is, how would the future be like? Because I do remember that in the article you described that you would envision a central ventilator and then basically I would imagine arms going to, I don't know, for example, 20 patients in ICU. So how would that presently, do you think presently that's feasible? And then how would the future look like? Yes, so it is feasible. We got a proof of concept in the last century when the a multi-patient ventilator got installed in the children's hospital in Boston. And again, we got a proof of concept and a couple of articles published around the COVID era for the split ventilators that has been used for many patients at the same time. As you mentioned, all those uh, examples came out for a period of crisis. So we have a shortage of machine or a shortage of um, healthcare professionals, then you need to come up with those ideas and they work. Um, we hope never to be in this shortage in the future. We might be again, so it's important to keep this possibility in the back of your mind. But if you think in a bright, rich future, you want to believe that you can have individualized care where every single patient is cared individually with all the resources. So there is a split here between the ideal world of a rich, a limited re uh, country with has no... Uh, constraints uh, and this looks at individualized care with all this very last uh, fashion monitor given to everyone and the reality of a war, a pandemic, a crisis and a shortage of healthcare professional or devices and then the split ventilator of the central ventilator is something we need to keep on the back of our mind and still consider and it has been proven to work not so well, maybe not for the frail elderly patients in the critical care, maybe be in the operating room where you have healthy elective procedures and you need to go on and maybe save money and just be efficient more than individualized. So it's good to know that the concept has been proven and exists. 
I have a question um, live here, um, which I think basically would affect uh, all of us. But I know that Pascal is a, is a, a an expert in in uh, big data as well. Um, Craig Webster asked the following question: Future applications of uh, AI are exciting, but what about the bias that we know affects AI's deep learning systems taught on big data are inherently prone to bias. Uh, Pascal, I know that you've done your fellowship in the United States. I know that everything or a lot of things are about DEI and we're obviously concerned about bias in, in data. I'm personally, uh, you know, obviously in uh, uh, support, you know, I'm a supporter of uh, TCI and I know that, for example, the TCI data goes back to the 80s and 90s and they're all on the specific um, uh, patient population. How do you see the um, the bias as a problem in, in AI going forward? Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, of course, a very, very interesting uh, thematic to discuss as AI models are are being published and published. And it's, it's interesting because some, some mob models will be published. They will show some very interesting results. Um, but then when we look at where are these result, results uh, coming from, we notice that there are some very obvious flaws and bias uh, within the data that was used to create that model. And unfortunately, some of these models are used widely even before they start noticing these bias. And I have a very good example in mind, which was um, basically some models that were predicting the um, rehospitalization after surgery for a patient. And ethnicity of the, um, of the patient was used to predict the readmission. And we noticed that uh, ethnicity with lower socioeconomic status uh, generally were less prone to come back, but they were less prone to come back maybe because, because they didn't have the resources to come back. So basically they were discharged earlier than the others who were flagged as being at risk of being rehospitalized but they were, they were flagged for the wrong reasons. So all of that to say that it's a very, very interesting topic to, to keep in mind. And I believe that one of the key aspects to make sure that we get rid of as much bias as possible is uh, to ensure that the data collection uh, are collected the right way and that the models before being deployed and before being widely used are tested in a wide, wide variety of uh, different population. Um, there are a lot of uh, ethical uh, consideration in there. I think there won't be a, a single answer, but uh, I think that vigilance is the the key uh, the key aspect here. I don't know if uh, Dr. Rubulata, you have an opinion on it. I, I see you nodded a lot. <laughs> yeah, I, my my belief, and I'm not an expert as you are, is that uh, the system get trained, and the more data, the more we use, the more actually we're gonna. Um, fight those bias. So we are scared to start using, but the more we use, the more the system learn and improves. Am I wrong or is it true? Oh, I guess exactly. The same it's... for anesthesiologists. The longer you do anesthesia, the more you learn, unless you're sort of like stuck in your ways of thinking. But I know that the, the that's the hope, for example, for JetGPT as a simple example of AI, that the more you lose it, the more it will actually accommodate yourself. I mean, there's JetGPT now, even for French, Pascal and myself, we are uh, more in the Francophone world here, but it, they start with the French from France, and then they're finally getting to the uh, former colonies, uh, like uh, us in Quebec, and so they will uh, adjust themselves. Uh, we have one more question for uh, Pascal, and I think that's the, the last question we have left. Um, and that's basically, uh, this time, I don't. it's not a question about the future, but Many people, or very very few people, at least in North America, actually do use um, nociceptor monitors. Now, Pascal is one of the few people who actually writes about things he, he uses himself in clinical routine, which is not very frequent. And um, But he has a lot of experience with the nociceptors. Is, is there one monitor which you would recommend to our listeners at this point as to say, I think you got to get that and it'll improve your clinical practice? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a good question and at first I'll say that I have um, no uh, financial interest at all in the answer that I'll be I'll be giving um, here at Maison Neuve-Rosemont Hospital in Montreal we have the null index so the PMD uh, 2000 monitor 200 monitor in each of our operating rooms 
which provide the multi-parametric null index, which is the one that we are using to uh, to assess the nociception throughout the surgery. So, of course, there has been some some publication on all the different monitors that uh, I, I briefly spoke about in this webinar, in which we described in more depth in the paper. Um, however, the most experience I have really is with this multi-parametric um, uh, monitor, and it's the only one to incorporate these uh, multiple parameters. So if we loop um, back what these are, we're thinking about the skin conduct conductance, we're thinking about uh, the amplitude of the plethysmography and the variation of this amplitude through time, the, the beat to beat variability. Um, and skin conductance, I think I already said it, and the variation of these uh, through times. And I'm, of course, a true believer that the more data that you use in your model to uh, predict the, per the, the outcome that you're attempting to predict, the better your prediction can become. So um, based on this and based on my own uh, experience, I think that the null index is a good uh, monitor. But of course, I haven't played so much with the others, so uh, I don't want to uh, throw them out there either. I think they are all are uh, quite relevant. Okay, thanks everyone. I think we're right on time. So um, don't forget that the webinar will be uh, uploaded to um, the website uh, in a couple of days and you can actually listen to it again and read it again. And I think if you wanna get a complete picture of everything which we envision for the future, um, please uh, go into the website and um, have a look at all the other um, 11 articles uh, published um, about this theme. Thank you very much and uh, see you next time. Thank you.